Prior to Morgan Company, Blake was Vice President with Workers' Compensation Fund Insurance for over 24 years. He was an integral, integral part of WCF during its transformation from a quasi-government agency to the current mutual insurance company. Blake attended Weaver State, BYU, University of Utah, and completed his bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Phoenix. He's married to Nancy <coughs> 36 awesome years. They have seven children, 11 grandchildren, and three Labrador retrievers. <laughs> Blake loves the outdoors of Utah, including water and snow skiing, golfing, biking, camping, hunting, riding horses, and an occasional chance to do some good old-fashioned tractor work. Please welcome Blake Green. Well, this is awesome to be here, and um, we're, we're close to the bird refuge, and so in tribute to the birds, um, my voice sounds very similar to a Canadian goose. Um, I've got a bit of a cold, and so it's, right now, I think it's not as bad as it was uh, the last couple of days, so I hope it'll hold up, but I, I appreciate your... Patience with me if it starts to fade on me a little bit. So, um, question: Anybody here have a background in accounting, um, rather than HR, accounting, statistics, um, actuary? No. Great. <laughs> um, so there will be a couple of slides that uh, that have to do with um, the topic today is is learning how to control your experience mod. Has everybody heard that term before, experience mod, and kind of know what that is? Yeah? Some of you? Most of you? We just okay. Googled it. You just Googled it? <laughs> so you're learning some things. Okay. So all of you should have a little red packet. Did everybody get one? Most everybody get one? Each county did. Each one per county. So if you... Um, if you want to sit closer to somebody from your county so you can share that information, um, you're welcome to kind of move around if you need to so that you yes. can see this. You don't need to go through that packet quite yet. So I'm going to go through a few things first and then we'll, we'll get into that. So I thought I'd start with a little, uh, some attention grabbers. Um, is the lighting on this okay? Can you see this? Or do we need to shut down some lights around here? Whatever works better. Can you see that okay? Kind of. So this was, uh, I actually took this picture. Uh, this was just outside of my office up in Ogden. And uh, I noticed some, uh, some guys doing a roofing project that was right, right through the parking lot of ours. And um, anyway, uh, you see any issues or problems with what's going on there? <laughs> Uh, pretty amazing, you know, so you, you look at uh, uh, a number of things including the attire, <laughs> yeah. the construction attire that he's wearing, which are, you know, tennis shoes, no shirt, uh, pretty skillful, really, when you look at uh, what he's doing with this one on the right side, you know, one, one leg on, one leg off, uh, using a nail, gun, a, a nail gun, that nail gun is pretty heavy, by the way. So, and then you can see on this other picture, he's carrying some pieces of plywood up to the top. There's three pieces there. Um, and when he gets close to the top of the ladder, the three pieces started to separate on him, which was trouble because he would like to let go of the wood and just drop it down on the ground. But if he does, it's gonna slide down his chest and fill him full of uh, wood chips. Um, so he was kind of in a dilemma. He did pull this off. I went and talked with him and. It, his uh, counterpart, and um, it, I, I said, uh, I felt compelled to, I'm, I'm in the risk management, I couldn't just walk away. I didn't know if we were, I didn't even know if we insured this company, but I just kind of went, I can't just allow that to go on. You know, he's, he seems like a nice guy, and so did his partner. We're kind of uh, like cops that way, like when we see risk, we have to respond. We have to respond, we're compelled to, right? All of you. So I did, and, and it came across a little bit awkward because I'd taken these pictures. And so when I went and talked to him, um, I said, you guys are hard workers. They said, oh, thanks. I said, I've watched you. You get here early in the morning. You're staying late. Um, this is about 6 o'clock at night when I went and talked to him. And I said, would you mind, can I get your cell number? I'd like to send you some pictures. 
And the guy looked at me really weird, and I said, no, whoa, 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 wait. Uh, <laughs> I said, there are pictures of you, and I'm concerned about what you were doing here, you know. So it, it was a little weird the way I presented that, but I sent him these pictures so that he would know, and I just said, you know, uh, I'm really concerned about what you're doing there, and I said, you're obviously very athletic, you pulled this off, but I said, um, the odds will catch up with you on this, and, and hopefully they were able to do it. Um, the interesting thing is, is that, um, that these guys were working, like I said, they were there pretty much every morning, 7 o'clock till 6, they were really hard workers, and I didn't see them taking a lot of time off. And when I told them that, they said, well, you should tell our boss, because he thinks we're really slow, and that we're not doing a good job, and that we're... It was really interesting, uh, the perspective. Um, and the same job, um, if they would have had, anyone know what a cherry picker is? You know, the machines that go up and move. If they'd have had a cherry picker, they could have done the job in probably half the time, and they would have been, in, you know, in compliance, <coughs> and it would have gone really well. Um, another one that I took, um, I was with a client. This one, um, from, from where we're standing right here, this is a building that's um, a half a mile north of us in Farmington. And so um, I was working, I was doing a uh, worker's comp renewal with a client, and they said, hey, this building next to us um, has had the paramedics over there three times already on the job site. And this is a three-story building, it's not really all that big. Um, and I said, really? And so he opened, I said, well, open the blinds, let me see what's going on. So he opens his blinds, and this is the first thing we saw when you open the blinds. So this is a guy, uh, can you tell what's on the roof? Snow. Snow, snow on the roof, so what does that mean it's on the plane? Ice, Ice and snow. Um, and so this guy gets to this top gable, he's trying to do you know, stucco, and um, he can't reach it, so what does he do? Grab a bucket, because that's a safe way to do this. He's up um, probably, he's up at least 30 feet off the ground, maybe a little more. Um, and um, so the great thing about this bucket in particular is that it's empty. All right, so if you're gonna stand on a bucket, which kind of bucket is more stable? Empty, full, right? You want a full bucket, this one's empty. So he's up 30 odd feet and on an empty bucket. Um, anyone know anything about scaffolding and safety requirements or OSHA or anything else? Is the scaffolding itself okay? No, why? What what should happen? He should be tied off if he's up that high. Well, he could be tied off. The scaffolding is actually, um, you don't have to be tied off on scaffolding at certain heights, but they yeah. didn't. What's that? Yeah, so what you see on this level right here, below, with the railings and things, that should have been built up one more level. Why didn't they do that? Time and money, right? So it's gonna cost extra to build the scaffolding correctly one more level just to do that little, you know, that little piece right there so they skip that step. So um, he didn't fall on this side, so now he has to do the gable on the other side, so what did he do? Same thing, move the bucket again, okay? Um, do I have to push something to get this to play? Do I just click on it? Oh, there's the play. No? I think that's it. Um, this one, this one is worthy of at least an explanation. Um, 
This, this is a Pretty dicey, um, and I won't explain this one. But uh, so the question, the question that kind of the overriding question is this: Okay, is your is the county's program um, based on and strategy when it comes to preventing injuries and handling claims? Is it based on luck, or is there an actual plan in place? Okay, and as we talk about experience mods, the reason that I start with this is because this is really where the rubber hits the road. This is what's most important is, do you have a plan in place or do you just rely on flat out luck and hopefully it goes well and whatever the experience mod is, that's, you know, you, everybody hears that. It is what? what it, is. it is what it is, right? There's nothing we can do about it. Um, but the bottom line is, is, is if I were to sit down and go through and when we pull out the experience mods for each of your organizations, and if I had you raise your hand and say, tell me what your experience mod is, there's gonna be a great variation, okay? And so we'll talk about the best way to try and help mitigate and, and have the very best experience mod you can. And above and beyond all of this is not the experience mod and the cost. What, what is the bottom line of all this? It's people, right? Um, people matter. The whole reason that we do this is that lives are at stake. Um, and not just lives, but um, in workers' comp, it's, it's lives and quality of life, right? If you go home and you're missing appendages, fingers, you no longer can you have the use of your arm, your legs, you're paralyzed. Um, so all of these types of injuries are things that um, over 24 years of doing workers' comp insurance, I've seen it all. The burn victims, the brain trauma, the paralysis, the loss of limbs, the loss of sight, the loss of hearing, um, the loss of life, and it matters, and it, it's a huge difference to people, okay? So that's what this is really all about. We'll talk numbers and statistics and, and EMOTs, but really what we're talking about is people, and that's what's most important, okay? So um, one of the things that, that you should ask yourself on a regular basis is, the program you currently have in place, is it based on compliance? Okay, it's a set of rules, regulations, do's and don'ts, and it's very, you know, and penalties if you do or don't do this, or is it behavior-based programs? Why, 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 and what's the difference between those two? Anybody have any thoughts on, what's the difference between a compliance-based and a behavior-based? Right. And, um, anyone, anyone have any children? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Which one works better? It depends on the day. It depends on the day. So sometimes... And the child. Yeah, and so it's different, right? I mean, some people do respond to this compliance, you better do this, or, you know, this is going to happen, and, and there are different personalities. Over time, over time, the, the question is, um, if we were to think about all of the job duties, think about every job duty within the counties, okay? which is vast. The counties have so many different departments and operations and job specific duties. Is it possible for you to write a regulation of how to do everything on a compliance basis? Could you write a rule and a, you know, a job description that defined for every single job duty this is the safest way to do it. Is it possible to even do that? No, you can't. The job duties change so rapidly, right, and these responsibilities. Would you want to do it? I mean, nobody would want to take that responsibility on. 
So the behavior based is trying to tell people, hey, take responsibility for your own safety and and let's let's base it on you know using your head, some common sense. I realize not everybody has common sense, right? That's a challenge for a number of people. And uh, I thought that was you know. At one time, I thought you could train anybody to do something safely, but then I remembered a kid that I grew up with, and that kid would get hurt no matter what we did, um, no matter what we were doing as a group, um, he would trip over everything, and I just went, okay, now, if I think back, there are some people that are pretty injury prone, but um, behavior-based is always, over time, your best option. So think about that as you look at your programs, okay? Now, when you think about workers' compensation um, system, the system itself, there are a number of different players. Does this have a pointer on it? Yeah, yeah, there should be a little green line. Oh, right here. Okay, so there's all these, um, there's all of these players. There's the employee and the employer at the center. There's the insurance companies, the labor commission. So what do all these people do? And, and really what we're going to focus on is this group right here. It's called NCCI, National Council on Compensation Insurance. What is their responsibility as it pertains to workers' comp? Well, number one, they do the rate making. They have all the statistics on all of the insurers in the state of Utah. Um, so everybody that has workers' comp insurance in the state, all the employers, they're gathering payroll information, number of claims, cost of claims for all the employers. Okay? They collect it. So when I ask if you were an accounting or actuary, NCCI is an actuary firm, basically. They're collecting data, and then insurance companies pay them a fee um, to, to get information from them. They help determine the rates for workers' comp in Utah for all the different class codes. All right? um, they do EMOD ratings, and they also set the rules for um, how to do um, collect premium and how premiums distributed, the class codes, and all those things are done by NCCI. They're an independent rating bureau. The insurance companies have nothing to do with them. The insurance companies have no leverage with them. There's no finagling between them. They're an independent rating bureau. So if you were to say, what, give me some similarity or like an NCCI to someone else, okay? So if I were to liken NCCI to someone else, it would be like the credit bureaus for your own personal credit, right? So you can't manipulate them. Whatever your experience is and your credit rating on your pay and how you do things, that kind of is what it is, right? It's your past history and it tells your deal. Another uh, analogy would be um, your motor vehicle records. All of us have been developing our experience with our motor vehicles, whether we've had tickets or accidents and so forth over time. And, um, you know, we might move to a different insurance carrier, but what follows us, right? All of your tickets, all of your experience follows you. In NCCI, they're an independent rating bureau, and your um, experience is going to follow you wherever you go, okay? So hopefully that helps you understand them. By the way, um, or uh, anyone who um, takes on um, companies or organizations that try to run from this history um, is considered insurance fraud in the state. So if you try to manipulate or do things that would um, alter an experience modification can be considered insurance fraud. Okay, so let's talk about experience mods. They're produced by NCCI. It's mandatory um, if you have premium of $3,500 in premium over two years. So if you have premium of $3,500 for two years in a row, or if you have premium of $7,000 in any given year, over time you will be experience mod, mandatory. You're insured, you're gonna have an experience mod. That's also referred to sometimes as EMOD, XMOD, EMR, experience mod rating, um, experience modifier, or just mod. All means the same when you hear all these terms, okay? Um, and what does it do? It's using your history, past history, and they're looking at your payroll, how much payroll you have, and what class codes, okay? Whether it's county payroll or professional payroll, 
It takes the payroll and puts it into classifications, and then it looks at your number of claims and the cost of those claims, and it's, and it's using that past data to predict, to predict the future. So based on what's happened in the past, this is where we would predict your future losses to be. Okay? Um, and what it's doing is tailoring your premium to where your losses have been. It's individually tailoring it for each individual risk. Because remember, we said that NCCI does a group rate for every class code, all right? But not everybody's the same. Some people are performing better or worse than the average, and the experience mod is adjusting that. Okay, so let's go in a little bit more. So what it's doing is it's taking the base rate, or the, they call it sometimes a manual premium, or a base, or the average rate, um, and it's adjusting it to your specific loss experience for a period of time. And what period of time? It's a three-year period, and I'll show you an example of that. Um, so what it does um, is it gives the employer an opportunity to uh, put in programs, and not just programs, but behaviors that help you to beat the industry average. And if you do, you're rewarded. If organizations don't beat the industry average, what's going to happen? They're going to pay you more, right? So that's, that's kind of how this works. So let me give you an example. This is a simplified version. Uh, of what you would see in your packets when, when you look at these experience mods. But what they're doing is they're taking your three-year actual losses. So it's going to take three years worth of claims data, number of claims, cost of claims, and it divide that by the expected losses. So how do they know what expected losses are? Remember, they have all of the industry data together. So they can look at what the industry is averaging over a three-year period, and say, based on your payroll, this is where your expected losses should be, but these are where your actual losses were, okay? So industry average, and a lot of people ask this, hey, how are we doing, how are we performing? Are we better than industry average or are we worse, okay? And industry average would have an experience mod of 1.00, which just simply means 100%, okay? So my losses, if I'm hitting, yeah, if the expected losses for my um, for my industry, if the expected losses are $10,000, and I have $10,000 in losses, $10,000 divided by $10,000 is going to be one. And so, um, and how does that translate then into premium? For every dollar of premium I would pay, I pay a dollar. Doesn't change it. My premium stays what the industry average is. Okay. If I have a rating of a .99 or less. That means I'm better than industry average. If I'm at 1.01 or higher, I'm worse than industry average. So here's two examples. A $10,000 in premium um, at a 0.75 rating. 0.75 times 10,000 is $7,500. So they're pretty easy ratios to figure out, right? Um, one, I'm at 10,000, I pay the same. And at 1.25, I'm at 12,500, okay? So the highest EMOD I've ever seen, I had a client um, at one time that was a 2.67. Okay, 2.67. So for every dollar premium they should be paying, they're paying $2.67 um, on the premium dollar. So you can imagine if someone gets to that kind of mod, they've had a lot, they've had high frequency and they've had a high severity. Um, and you're not going to stay in business very long if you have that, right? And in the case of government entities, what would that kind of experience mod do to a government entity in terms of resources and so forth? It's going to soak up a lot of your money paying into something that, um, and, and I call um, tax dollars, because I'm a taxpayer, I'm in Davis County, I live in Saraville. So I call the money that goes into something like workers' comp as non-productive money because all we're doing in workers' comp is we're, we're trying to pay for something that happened to somebody to restore them to the best that we can restore them. Well, that doesn't do anything for the taxpayer. That's not providing additional service or 
you know, that's not an additional road or an improvement in a road or an improvement in a service or an improvement in law enforcement. It's really unproductive money. So we don't want to have experience mods over a one. We want, we'd love to see everybody uh, be under a one. Is it possible for everybody to be under a one? Think about this from a statistics standpoint. Is it possible for all the counties to be under a one? Yeah. It can't happen. Why? Because the number, will, the number will move. The number's moving all the time, right? So um, in theory, what can happen, and some people don't understand this, is that they say, oh, hey, my losses, my three-year losses have gone down you know, by whatever, 15%. And, and so my mod should go down. But if the industry also improved by 15%, you're still going to get the same number or close to it, right? So that, that industry average, right, you're always being compared to the industry average. So there's always going to be somebody over a one and people under a one because it's moving. Does that make sense? Okay, so what years do they use? That's an important thing. So I think we have everybody in this group is on a, a January 1 renewal date that I, um, and what they call, they also call it an ARD or anniversary rating date when you're, when this, um, this number recalculates. They don't use the current year you're in, okay? And there's a reason for this. These, these experience mods, the production date, when they actually look at the data, they're produced probably 90 days or earlier before your, the renewal. So you're part way, you only have you know, part of a year, and claims in workers' comp take the time to mature, to see you know, when an injury initially happens, we don't know if it's gonna be $500, $5,000, or $50,000, especially, let's say it's a back injury. Um, and we may not, you know, it might be something like ibuprofen, ice, rest, whatever, limit your, or it could be, oh, now we're gonna do um, an MRI, and now we're gonna do some other things, some injections, and that doesn't work, and now all of a sudden we're gonna do surgery, and we're gonna fuse it, and so a claim could be, like I said, $500, 5,000, or 50,000, depending on what happens. So in a case of a 2019 experience mod, whoops, go back to, um, right up here, we would be used, the data that NCCI would use is the 17 to 18, 16 to 17, 15 to 16, okay? And, um, and then for um, next year, for 2020, this year right here is going to drop off, and they would add the 18 to 19. Does everybody follow? So if you want to get kind of an idea of where you think your experience mod is going to move, what would you be looking at? What you'd be doing is you'd be taking this year that's going to fall off, and you would look at your new year that's going to be added over here and compare the, the losses. And then you'd have kind of an idea of where you think you're going to be trending. Um, so the information that they include in an experience mod. They look at your name, your risk ID, the effective date, um, and they're going to look at your payroll by class code. So if you were to look at your experience mod and go, nah, I when you look at the actual rating, it's just numbers and it's very confusing to look at. But we'll, we're going to do some examples so it makes it a little easier to read. Um, there's ratios. So that's why I ask if there's any accountants or actuaries you can see that that's not the cleanest, clearest description, right? Does that look a little overwhelming to some of you? It did to me the first time I saw it. I was like, I don't, I don't get this. The most important thing for you to look at would be over here. This is going to be the class codes that they're using for the counties. Um, and these would be your audited payrolls for the rating period. This particular example is a 4-1 um, renewal date. And so um, this is their effective date, 4-1 of 18. So they have three years worth of data, the, the 14 to 15, 15 to 16, 16 to 17. And these are the audited payrolls by class code. Okay? So um, you would want to just look at those and make sure those add up. The reason that's important is that Losses are based on your payroll. So if you were, if there was a digit that was off, 
And let's say that this really wasn't $590,000, it was $5,900,000. It's off by one digit. Would that make a difference? Yeah, because if you had these kind of losses over here on $5,900,000, that's a lot different than these kind of losses over here with 500,000. Okay, you have more people, more exposure, and there's more leniency. The higher your payroll, the more leniency for losses, as you would expect. So they've had some pretty severe claims over here. This is, um, this is the expected losses right here, um, $250 in um, expected losses, $747 for these class codes, and you can see what their losses were. Okay, so they were kind of on the high side over here. And you would expect that their mod was going to be high. Um, so they, there's some other things that NCCI does uh, that's important to understand. The first 16,500 of any claim um, is what they call primary losses. And they discount primary losses in the overall formula when you get down to their actuary tables. Okay? So just know that, um, that they do that. Um, I'm not going to spend time on that. But that's so what do they include in your losses? They look at the, the claim count, how many claims you have, the type of claims, there's injury codes. When you look at your um, claims data, um, if any of you are looking at your experience mods right now, so if you open your um, binders, and it looks like everybody's got them out, right? So hold one up so you can see. Would you hold this one up on the front? So this is, this is what you're looking at, this little white page. Um, you'll see over on this uh, column right here, um, this is telling you if it's open or final. So that, that's telling you whether that claim. And then there's this column right here, number eight. Um, IJ means injury code. So it's telling you whether that code um, is a medical only claim or if it involves lost time, okay? And they, de they define lost time in a number of different codes, and I'll show you what those codes are. But <clears throat> the important thing to remember is that, <clears throat> now my voice is gone. The important thing to remember is that medical only claims, so a person doesn't miss any time off, are discounted 70% in the formula. So if you take a three-year period, and for some counties, um, let, we'll use a big number. So let's say over a three-year period, your county had $100,000 in losses total. If all of those claims were medical only, nobody missed time off, that $100,000 is going to be reduced in this formula down to $30,000. Okay? So you can imagine what a difference that's going to make in your experience mod rating. And remember that the experience mod rating is um, when you have losses that are on there for three years. So it can make a huge difference in the total premium that you're paying year after year. Okay? All right. So let's go forward. How do we, I'm just looking at this and I'm kind of new, but how do we know what that, like, I'm looking at that, it has like a number of five or number six? I'm so gonna how do we know what those codes are? I'm going to show you. Okay. That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. And by the way, please interrupt. Um, just anything uh, is great. I appreciate you doing that. I should have let everybody know that you can ask questions as we go. Um, so what happens is that um, if there's claims that are medical only claims that are under $2,000, they're lumped together. So you might see a number on your um, worksheet that says five. And it means there's five claims, and they lump them all together. They were medical only, and then they put a total. Okay. Um, there's also claims that uh, that are greater. If they, if they're greater than two thousand dollars, you'll see the actual claim number next to the claim. So any claim that goes over the two thousand dollars, you're going to see um, the claim number listed there. And then when you get your loss run from WCF Insurance. You can look and see which claims are actually costing, you know, X amount of dollars. Um, so medical only claims uh, are grouped together. 
but medical only and indemnity claims are never grouped together. Okay? And then again, the O indicates it's open, and F is that it's final. By the way, um, if something has an F on it, um, does that mean it's final forever? No. F just means at the time they took the snapshot, that claim was closed. But the employee, um, let's say you had somebody that had um, surgery and they had hardware placed, you know, in the elbow, shoulder, back, or something, and, and it requires, not because they had a new injury, okay? So with no new injury, it's just the hardware gave out, something happened, um, just on normal wear and tear, that claim could be reopened. So final doesn't necessarily mean you will never see that claim open again. All right, so here's the injury codes that you're asking about, okay? So, you know, one is going to show that if it was a death, um, permanent total disability. A perm total is somebody that um, you would see those in cases of um, major amputations or paralysis, um, burn victims or things that, um, or brain trauma where they will never return to work again. That's a perm total, so they're alive, but um, then there's major permanent partial disability, these other definitions. The big thing that you're really looking at is you want to see, if you're going to have a claim, <laughs> you don't want to see claims, so, but if you're going to see them, you would love to see that rate, right, or that um, injury code, the medical only. Those are the coded claims that are going to be discounted 70%. Everything else, all those other codes, are going to be, are going to be rated at the full value. Okay? All right, so <clears throat> I talked to you about there's not a lot you can do with this piece, but the first 16,500 of any claim is rated as what they call primary loss. And primary losses are um, weighted heavier. Um, and things that are over 16,500 are considered um, excess loss, any of the amount over 16,500. And the reason they do that is that um, actuarially, actuarially it's hard to determine once a claim goes over 16.5 any significance of why did that happen? You know, is it because it happened to somebody, you know, that injury that happened, it was a slip and fall, and it happened with somebody that was over 60 and had diabetes and had bone deterioration versus somebody that had that same slip and fall that was in their 20s. I mean, you know, so that's why they discount claims as they get bigger. Does that make sense? It's a way of kind of adjusting for those groups. What happened there? PowerPoint needs to download. Oh, that's not a good idea. I, I don't know what that means. I've never seen that before. <laughs> Is everybody still with me so far? Haven't, haven't gotten too far? This looks like we're in the right place. <clears throat> Why he's on this one? Whoops. All right. It's just stalling out. Of me. It's stalling out. So down at the bottom, you see, um, if you were to have a really large claim, so let's say it's a fatality um, in workers' comp. If you have, if we have a, a fatality, and let's say it's a, a person that's young, married, has children, um, most of the time they're going to put on reserve. And by the way, when they're, when they're putting these numbers into NCCI, they're counting paid and reserved. So it's, um, that's, that's what's going to go to NCCI in the tables. So it's how much has actually had checks paid to the injured employee and to medical providers, as well as what's on reserve to pay to get the claim to close. If, um, if we have a fatality that's um, a, a, an individual that's married and has children and they're young, we will typically reserve that claim for close to a million dollars, what we anticipate to pay out. Um, and even higher numbers when you have um, things like the paralysis and um, burn victims and brain trauma, um, because those are going to be life care, so you'll have medical plus lost wages for the life of that person, and so those claims can be, you know, several million dollars. Um, in those cases, um, those are capped out. 
and this changes every year. So when I first started with uh, WCF back in 1995, the cap for a large claim was in the 80,000, 90,000 range. Um, each year it goes up because compensation and inflation. But right now they cap um, an individual claim at 142,000. And the reason they do that, if you didn't, if you actually had built into your EMOD formula a claim that was a fatality, and we've had um, the very first year that we wrote the USIP plan um, was 2010, and in the first um, 90 days, we had three fatalities, three officers that were killed in the first 90 days. Um, the experience laws for those counties, if you didn't cap those claims, would have been experience mods like 10s or 15s or 20s um, if you didn't cap them. If you just said, hey, let's just roll that through the formula. So that's why those are capped. Um, multiple claims, meaning um, a claim where multiple people are injured, would be capped at 284, 284,000. Is it going to let me go on? Something like okay. So while, while we're waiting on this to see if this is going to work, um, look at your uh, individual um, sheets. And again, um, if you look at this particular one, what you're going to see, uh, again, up in the, um, the production date on this particular one was, uh, this was for Duchesne County, Duchesne, um, was uh, October 1st. Uh, October 11th, 2018. So they produced the uh, experience rating in October, all right, and um, they had the rating available for them. I will tell you their rating yeah. and share with everybody what, what there's a. Especially with Davis County here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, by the way, um, any, any ideas on, on what you think um, a really low experience mod would be or which county may have hit the Nirvana, have you heard all the great stories about Davis County, uh, Davis County is awesome. Uh, where did Charlene go? Yeah, where is she? she um, oh, she belled on you. I can't believe it. Um, but Charlene definitely, she's, yes, she's, she's on it. But um, we have another county that actually was better what? at one time than Davis County that had the lowest experience mod. Um, it's, it's, you know, a county that sometimes sits in the very, very, very back of the room. Sometimes. Sometimes. Washington? Washington County. Um, yeah, Jonathan. Yeah, so they had, uh, was it 0.48? Oh my gosh. Yeah, they hit a 0.48 one year. Okay? So, um, for every dollar premium they would be paying, they were paying 48 cents on the dollar. That's pretty amazing. Beyond that, what does that tell you about um, the safety of the employees for that three-year period? For that three-year period, I mean, they essentially had, um, and I think they went almost that, that whole three-year period without a lost time claim. I'm not sure, but I kind of think when they got that rating, they hadn't had a lost time claim in 40, or in three years with their sites of payroll. So that's pretty impressive, right? They were getting people back to work. Number one, they weren't hurting people. Number two, they were getting people back to work. And they had a lot of the same exposures that all the rest of the counties do. So very impressive, yeah. So when we, when we make a file a claim, uh -huh. and it's for, say, a fall, and uh -huh. the employee just follows the file the claim, they refuse any treatment, but we still file the claim and nothing happens. Does that go against our rating? This is a, that's a terrific question. I love that. And, well, well done. Um, zero dollar claims do not impact the experience model. And um, WCF, in order to help facilitate that and put a peace of mind, added um, uh, an area on the claim that says information only. Have you seen that when you're filing claims? There's a place that says information only claim, um, which just means that we had an incident. We're trying to let you know they're, they're not seeking medical treatment. There's no lost time, um, so you can do that. But any claim that um, comes through on your carrier that is a zero dollar does not get included in the experience rating. Okay, that's a terrific question. You're thinking these things through, which is awesome. Okay, um, did that load or no? You're still working. That's right to that same slide. Something about that slide doesn't like. So we're gonna try oh, switching okay. to a different computer. Okay. Um, 
All right, so let's let's talk about some other things. Um, if you if you look at the other, um, so in addition to the experience mod that you have, right, which is your actual current rating, which is probably for some of you, it's a single page. Um, if you have more claims um, or more, or maybe a, a larger county, you might have a couple of pages, but you'll see. Um, on one of the pages, you'll see what your actual current rating is for 2019. Um, and then I also put one of these in your packet. It's called a mod analysis. And what it's doing is it's breaking down your claims to say, here's what your current experience mod is. Um, but if you turn up, and each page is a little different depending on your... Uh, depending on your county, but if everybody can turn to this page, it looks like this. This graphic um, it has green bars. And the reason this one is important is it's gonna show you what your current experience mod is midway on the page, if you're all looking kind of similar page. Halfway down the page, it's gonna say what your current experience mod is. The average is always gonna be a one. And then the minimum mod tells you if your county could have, in theory, gone three years without a loss. In theory, if you could go three years without a loss, what's the lowest your mod would be? So it tells you what your minimum mod is. And then a controllable mod tells you the difference between what the very minimum your mod could be and where your current mod is, that's in theory what the controllable portion is. Okay? Um, and everybody has a copy of that. The other thing that we that I put in there um, is a list of um, specific claims. If you look, there's specific claims that are listed there. And you'll see that... Uh, the injury date of the claim, and how much the loss was, and how much that particular claim impacted your experience mod. So you can see individual claims and how they're impacting um, your your mod. In some cases, I don't know if it's going to pull this up yet. Is it still stuck, or did he's got to get the clicker? Oh, I got the clicker right here. You want me to try it? Can I try it? Wow. Oh, there we go. Magic. Thank you so much. Okay. This is the best example I could give you of what I was telling you about with claims being medical only and lost time. So here's a claim that uh, occurred in 2014. It's a $12,000 claim, but it was a medical only. Okay. So. And this just shows you that even on larger claims, people are able to get people back to work and not have that be a lost time claim. So it gets discounted down to the 30%, um, and their, um, the impact on their mod was um, less than 1%, okay? So it's 0.94 it's, uh, of a percent on their experience mod. That's what these numbers represent. The total cost on their um, premium over three years for that claim was $15,000 for this particular risk. This is not accounting, by the way. It's a different kind of risk, but still it shows the same thing. Here's a $5,681 claim. This claim is half of where this other claim is. But look at, um, it was fully valued. So it's a lost time claim, even though it's less and look at the impact over three years on the premium. So it impacted their experience mod by 1.38%, and the premium was changed by 22,000. See the difference on those two claims? One is half the value, but ends up being you know $7,000 more in the total cost to that organization. <coughs> So this was the page I was showing you on each of you have. So it shows you what your current mod is, what the average mod is, what the minimum is, and this controllable is the difference between minimum and your current. Okay? And this is what this is the part that you're trying to work on. 
Um, in this particular example, again, not a county, um, this particular risk was at a $150,000 disadvantage because of their mod being at a 1.28. So there, you, you, um, you figure with a, a private company how much money they have to produce in order to make up that $150,000 disadvantage. They gotta do a lot of work to make that up. So it's a big deal. And, and in your cases, it's tax dollars, right? So I talked about productive money and non-productive money. You know, that's non-productive. It's, all it's doing is trying to restore somebody back to where they were, to the best of their you know, the ability. And in some cases, you can't do that. And money doesn't make up. When people lose, have amputations, paralysis, it's not made up in money. They don't come out better because of the workers' comp. It's not a good trade-off. So um, I, I threw this one in there just because um, uh, there was a house bill that was passed 288 uh, a little over a year ago, and it makes it un unlawful for an employer to knowingly or intentionally interfere with an employee's ability to make a workers' compensation claim or to retaliate against the employee if they do make a claim. So you can't you can't force things on people and say, hey, well this can affect affect our EMOD. Um, you don't, see, you don't see this so much um, in uh, the public sector because people, but you can see it um, in the private sector. And particularly, there's a challenge. Um, construction companies uh, are under a lot of pressure to keep their experience mods under a one because um, if you're in large construction and you're bidding on federal projects, state projects, or even a large project, Things that can caught, things like the airport, that's you know obviously a federal state project. If you're over a one, you don't get to bid. You're not even invited to the party if your experience mod's over a one. So you can see that some of these might be trying to maybe help people not file a claim when there's something going on. Um, not trying to necessarily be fraudulent, but you can't do that. Blake? Yeah. I just wanted to point out, when that came off, we talked about that with the HR, and hopefully you, you, you're keeping tabs on your different departments. Some departments put some really um, questionable safety incentive programs in place where, hey, if nobody has any injuries in your department for the year, you get a bonus, or you get, I mean, Sandy City paid dollars if your department had no losses and individual employees if you didn't have any workers comp injuries for so many years every single year you went without getting injured on the job you got a bonus you can't do that anymore because it violates this law now so be careful of those incentive programs that your departments are putting in place because it might violate this law yeah you just you have to be you just have to be careful um, you don't want to intimidate or do anything that discourages. Um, they, they, they haven't done away completely with incentive programs, so people can still have them. You just have to make sure they're administered in a fashion that doesn't result in this. So that's a great point, Johnny. Thanks for... Any questions on this piece? Were you raising your hand? Because this is an auction, right? Boom. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. So um, there's some other components in here. If you have a drug testing program, um, in, in some cases, um, if someone tests positive for drug use, um, that can eliminate um, the lost wage portion of the claim and we only pay medical benefits um, if the drug contributed to the cause. So um, know that that's an important thing. How many people have drug-free workplaces or a lot of you have those in place? Okay. All right, so that can help keep a claim to a medical only if that's uh, part of what you do. So, what are some of the takeaways? And then let me see what, uh, how we're doing on time. Oh, we're, we're ahead of time. So, a um, couple of things, and I'm gonna talk about how do you, how do you keep a claim to um, a, a medical only claim? What, is, what are the tricks? So, um, in the state of Utah, if you have a person that's injured and they go seek medical treatment and the doctor says, ah, I'm gonna take you off work until, I don't want you doing anything. I don't want you to go to work, you can't do anything 
for a certain period of time, what are those deadlines, okay? So it's important to know. Number one is that they don't count the day of the injury. So I'm gonna give you an example just so we can kind of go through this. Somebody's injured on a Wednesday, okay? Date of injury is not counted in the state of Utah. But if the doctor says, I don't want them back to work in any capacity, they're not to come back to work until Monday. All right, so now they're gonna start counting days that this person was taken off of work as a lost time. They would count Thursday, they count Friday, count Saturday, count Sunday, and you say, whoa, 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 wait, wait, this person was not scheduled or they were gonna be on vacation um, for those days. Doesn't matter, the doctor took them off of work, okay? So that may have been their vacation days. It could be that they were not scheduled. It might be that you're closed on Saturday and Sunday. Still gonna count those as days. Um, it could be their holidays, right? You may have Friday as a holiday, it doesn't matter. If they took them off of work, it's calendar days that they take them off. And once they go have three over three days, and they don't have to be consecutive, so if they took them off a day here, and then they did a follow-up visit, they took them off another day, once they exceed three days, that, um, and they can't come back in any capacity, right? So um, as a county, what, what do you try to do with your medical providers? Now, number one is that you want to go and visit with your local medical, whoever you're using as your designated provider, you go and visit with them, and you let them know that you provide Temporary modified duty. Now, I've used some new words to you because a lot of times um, what you hear is we're putting them on light duty. Okay, what, and what's that connotation? When when you hear the word light duty, what does that sound to you? What, what is it? What does it kind of sound like? like they, don't they, don't do huh? they don't have to do that. Yeah, finally. Yeah, I mean when I hear light duty, I'm going oh easy street, right? So that means I come in when I want, I leave when I want, I take extra lunch, I just. I don't have to do much, like Judy, I'm on easy street. So they've tried to get a mindset, and so you'll hear, not everybody does it, but you're, you're trying to hear people say temporary, okay? Temporary, meaning this is not your new, this is not the new norm. <coughs> temporary modified. So it's temporary meaning that we're gonna evaluate for a temporary period of time this work and we've modified the work that you normally do to accommodate your restrictions. Okay, not light duty. If your job is that you have to be here at eight o'clock, guess what? You still have to be here at eight o'clock. You don't get a roll in at eight thirty because you're or nine or ten because you're on light duty. You don't get to leave an hour early because you're on light duty. It's the same work schedule. Okay, so it's temporary and we're modifying. That. To duty with certain restrictions that meet the doctor's orders and in most cases unless you have a severe case and I'm talking about se severe cases of being hospitalized um, you can bring people back on modified duty um, and so you want to in advance in advance of any injury you meet with the medical providers you let them know that you provide modified duty and that you're gonna you'll meet the restrictions whatever they are um, and you'll bring them back do they have to come back to their exact same job duties? No, no, it can be a modified duty. Does it have to be the same department? No, it can be a different department if it's needed to adjust for that work. Um, can the modified duty include um, going to the WCF website and watching safety videos? Yeah, sure, that can be part of the modified duty. So um, can the modified duty include them, you know, having their leg up on a, a rest so it's elevated so that, you know, it keeps the swelling down and icing it. Can you do that as part of modified duty? Yeah, all of those things can be done to modify and help keep that clean. So um, is all of that done, is everything we're talking about, is all, all of that done just so that we can keep the mod down? What's it? So what does it do? Keeps your employee at work. Keeps your employee at work. And does that hurt them or help them? Yeah. yeah. So the studies actually show this is a blessing and a help to employees. Because there's a mindset, there's a disability mindset that people get into when they're out of work and 
away from what their normal routine is. Okay? And that mindset tells you that the longer you stay off work, the longer you will stay off work. Um, and, and there's some statistics, and say statistics that show if people are off work over six months, their likelihood of returning to meet an employee drops dramatically. So the longer people are out, the longer people are going to be out. It just adds. Um, and they get into a disability mindset that just says, whoa, is me. Um, it turns out that people that are out on work, um, they have more doctor visits. They have higher prescription drug use. They have higher medical use. So diagnostic tests. They want more MRIs. They want more CAT scans, more tests, more doctors. And it just, you know, and that doesn't mean when we have these serious injuries, you know, where, you know, and orthopedics involved in all those, that we're, nobody's trying to discount any of those kind of claims. But there is this mindset that gets into people that, um, that, that we try to avoid. And bringing people back to work, it turns out, is the best medicine. And I'll give you an example from my youth. Um, when I was young, and I didn't want to go to school on a given day, and some of you have done this, right? Your parents come to wake you up. I don't, I don't feel good today. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm really sick. I don't want to go. And um, I had a dad who just, you know, was, he wasn't a relentless guy. He was very nice. And he'd say, oh, I, I'm really sorry. Um, why don't you get up, have breakfast, and have a shower, and we'll see how you feel. That defeats the entire purpose because what I really want to do is sleep in, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. The bed feels good. I really want to sleep in. And by the time I have breakfast and I'm showered, I might as well go to school because if I don't go to school and I stay home, I know that for me in our house, you didn't get a play that day. You know, there was no playing. It was basically you got to stay down and... Um, and on TV, there was a total of four channels, right? It was two, four, five, and 11. So there was nothing on TV. Um, and so I just went, okay, I've already showered. I've had breakfast. I'm going to school. So, um, and that's kind of the mindset we want people to get in, is stay in the routine even though you've had the injury. And, and I give this example. Some people say, well, how do you know whether you should file a workers' compensation claim for something? And I just say, if you were at home and the same thing happened to you, would you go to the doctor? That's how I know. And, and you, there are some people that will go to the doctor for everything, and there are some that will just put duct tape on everything. So you do have to, you know, you have to gauge that a little bit. And there might be some people where you go, no, that is pretty serious, and your finger's about to fall off. So we, you know, and the tendon's hanging out, or it's been cut, and you can't move your finger, and you're going to end up with one like this if you don't be careful. So. Um, so there are some people that will do that with, but um, a good gauge is if, if this was happened at home, would you seek medical treatment? If the answer is yes, then let's go get your medical treatment and find out what's going on. Okay, um, but we're going its not what was me. The fact that it happened at work doesn't make it more severe than if it happened at home. Because if it happened at home, we'd still be trying to figure out a way to get better so that I can go back to work. So the mindset mindset should be the same either way. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so um, we want to keep we want to keep it um, less than three days, and it's calendar days, and it counts whether they're scheduled for work, not scheduled for work, holidays, vacation. It's three. The doctor says you can't come back, and we need to work with the medical providers. By the way. Um, so some of you are always worried about HIPAA, right? You've probably had training about HIPAA and everything else. Does that apply to, apply to workers' comp injuries? No, that's the health insurance and health privacy. So um, an employer is entitled to know the extent of an injury, not their prior health issues, but the extent of that injury and how it affects their ability to do their job. You get to know that. How does the injury that they had at work affect their ability to do their job? So I get to know that, and I can talk to the doctors or providers to get that information. Hospitals are kind of tough on getting it. They don't always understand that and may throw out the HIPAA and all the rest, and you say, look, I get that, but we're the employer. I'm not asking for their prior medicals. I'm not asking for things like do they have diabetes or whatever else. I'm asking that injury, how does it affect their ability to come back to work? 
Okay. Also, hospitals typically don't do drug testing if something's taken in an emergency, um, but IHC does have an after hours. Um, the work beds, if you talk with them, they have an after hours that will go and do on-site drug testing if you need that done. But if you're doing drug testing, just know emergency rooms and stuff, they're not worried about your drug testing and they're not worried about your return to work. So um, we do have a lot of um, our employers that will take an employee that's gone to an emergency room after hours and still funnel them back through either a work med or through their preferred provider as a second visit, even though it does add an extra visit, um, it's okay because it gets you back into um, a system of occupational medicine. So doctors that are in occupational medicine have a different mindset than a, um, what you would call your primary physicians that we all have. So um, Oc medicine has a mindset of getting people back to work in their regular job duties. Whereas um, somebody, if they go to their primary physician, that primary physician is worried about how many visits you make to me and I keep you as a client. That's what I'm worried about if I'm a primary physician. And so whatever you ask me to do, if you say, hey, I'm at my primary physician and you say, I really think I could use a couple of weeks off, it's nothing for a primary physician to rate two weeks off. And they're not going to care about, you know, return to work. So it's another reason why um, in Utah, employers can mandate um, a preferred provider to go to for things that are not life and limb threatening. So hopefully everybody has set up a primary physician network and you've coordinated um, where you're going to send people for those visits. Okay? All right. So um, the first takeaway, the EMOD, um, is it what it is? Yes and no. The mod that you current have, currently have is what it is. You can't do anything about it. As long as the data that's in there is accurate, which in most cases it's dead on, can't do a lot with it. But can you do something with what's going to happen in the future? Um, yes, that's where you have a chance to, to try to have programs in place, but a behavioral-based safety program that has people take responsibility for their own safety and the safety of their employees, that's what you want. When you see individuals on job sites in different places saying, hey, we can't do it this way, or making a call saying, hey, we need a different piece of equipment, and you see individuals taking responsibility, that's behavioral based. And that's when you know your program's working well, right? It's not looking over your shoulder for compliance. It's because we know that we have the authority to, and right on the front lines to do the job right. Okay. Um, that's the safety culture. There's a focus on return to work, right? So we want to do that before an injury occurs. So as part of your um, employee orientation, this should be part of it right here. People should understand when you do your um, orientation, number one, um, we have safety protocols and things in place. We have personal protective equipment. That might be gloves, boots, eye protection, ear protection. We have things to keep you safe. We expect you to take responsibility for safety on your own. Um, so there's some expectations. If you pull out in your um, binders, I think I gave you a checklist in there. Um, it's a double-sided. You see those in your packets? That's it right there. Okay. So if you look at this, um, this piece right here, um, I've got two things on here. One says, employees roles and responsibilities so this is part of something you can do in an employee orientation and training up front and this is where you say here's what we expect of you as an employee these are what we think you sh or, or what we expect not think this is what we expect you to do you know you need to maintain your job in a, in a drug-free manner you're not going to do drugs in the workplace you're going to follow safety rules and protocols um, you're going to use proper safety equipment and tools. Um, you're not going to uh, participate in a horse play on the job. So there's certain things. This is the list of expectations. On the back side is a checklist that you can give to every department and manager within your organization. That checklist tells them 
do you have, not for the county as a whole, but for your individual department, can you check off and say that you have these things in place? Do you have responsible people? Do you have people that understand how to do the job correctly with the right tools in every department? Okay, So that's the checklist. That's what helps you um, to get things in place. Up front, when you do training and orientation, is where you also, like I said, explain to people, if for some reason all of these things failed and you do get an injury, here's where you're going to go for treatment. Here's who you notify. Um, and here's our protocol. We will provide modified duty and we will bring you back on a temporary uh, job. And you let people know that right up front so that there's a mindset. By the way, <clears throat> if you had somebody that was trying to take advantage, maybe they've run out of PTO, maybe they're just an employee that's always sick, always taking advantage of your organization, um, what does the return to work program do for those? If they're always trying to take advantage. You can't fraud the system when they have to come back. Because if, if they say, yeah, no, I'm going to pass, I'm not going to do that modified duty, then what happens? Well, they uh, just, just depending on what you decide to do, they won't get their compensation benefits. They're not going to be paid comp. Mm -hmm. If they say, no thanks on that uh, modified temporary job, then you say, I'd rather sit home, just say, I understand you won't be receiving your compensation benefits. Okay? Um, so we want to focus, if, uh, number one, on not having claims, but we're not going to hide claims. We're not going to try to intimidate people. If they do happen, we're going to try to get them back to work on a, on a temporary basis. Temporary. And if it's temporary, what does that mean is the responsibility of the supervisor or the, the department? You have to follow up on it, okay? So you don't want people just sitting out on that temporary job. It means that, um, and typically, if, and if you don't know how to put this program together, WCF provides um, a half-day training program specifically on putting together a modified duty um, work program. They have a DVD, and they have sample letters that you can send to a person saying, here's our modified offer. Um, if you don't take it, then... <coughs> We won't pay it. We don't want to put them into a job where they could make the injury worse, though, correct? Yeah. Um, and that, and, and uh, of all the years that I've been with WCF, that rarely happens. So you definitely don't, and you're not trying to punish people. You're not, you're not, you're not going to put them in a job to demean them or to punish them because they had an injury because that could be you know, construed as retaliation. What we're trying to do is just say, here's what the restrictions are, and we're going to temporarily modify the duty to meet those restrictions. And make sure their direct supervisor understands the restrictions, because so that's, that's what happens. So that's my question. So who's liable then if you say, okay, the employee comes back with the restrictions and it's, you can't lift 50 pounds. But their job typically requires them to do that. So you say to the employee, okay, do everything in your job except for the thing that requires you to lift 50 pounds. And you explain to the supervisor they can't lift 50 pounds, don't have them do that job. And you send them on their way. And then the supervisor's not around and they have to do the thing that requires them to lift the 50 pounds. And so they lift the 50 pounds. Is the soup, are we liable because she lifted, you know, she did it or is she? We yeah. told her not to, but like, do you you're, know what I'm saying? You're going to pay for the aggravation to the injury. We yeah. are? You'd pay, but it's, it's, not a, it's not a liability in terms of now you're going to be sued. It's still covered under the protection of the exclusive remedy of a worker's comp claim. Um, and um, there, there, are some, um, there are some things that are in the statute that I didn't put up here. Um, for example, if um, a company has a written safety program and a, um, an employee willfully violates that, and the cases that we've been able to, um, to do this have been cases where there's clearly, number one, the Utah law is that you have to wear your seatbelt. Okay? Sure. And that's a law. And people also put it in their um, program or their safety program, you have to wear your seatbelt and people don't. And then they're in an accident and they have lost time. We've been able to pull that lost time portion out because they willfully violated 
um, a safety program. So that's my point. Yeah, and so you know there might be some things that the, the claims adjuster, and it's on a case by case sure. basis, would maybe look at and say, "Hey, look, the um, the employer didn't ask you to do that. You willfully violated, um, and so they may be able to. You know, it just depends. They have to look at the cases, but know that um, having programs in place, safety programs." with clear understanding of what you expect of employees. Um, and, and that comes into play um, with horse play as well. So if you say, look, we don't tolerate horse play, and then somebody's injured in horse play, then um, they can back off uh, a lot of times the, um, the lost wage portion on a claim. When people willfully violate um, organizations, policies, and procedures. And, um, let me give you an example where that wouldn't play very well, and that is, let's say, you know, you have a, a policy of wearing safety glasses, but it's never enforced and nobody does it. Right. And now somebody has an eye injury, um, then that, that's not going to play very well because they'll say, yeah, nobody does it. Um, so one other quick thing, and am I done with that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I just went over my time. So um, the one thing you do need to know is that um, if somebody has what's called an impairment rating, so let's say that I have an injury and I cut off a tip of a finger and it's, it can't be sewn back, right? It's just, it's gone, it's over, and now I have what's called a permanent impairment right there. Um, and I, they, they repair it to the best of their abilities and they send me back with a wrap and I go back to duties. Um, I'm gonna get what's called an impairment rating in the workers' compensation benefit program uh, for the loss of that fingertip. And that's going to go as lost wages. It's going to show as a lost time claim. And um, I didn't miss any time off work, but I get an impairment rating. So know that that's one of those rare cases. There's not that doesn't happen. Um, you might see that on a claim somewhere where you go, hey, how come that ended up as a lost time claim? And if they had an impairment rating like that, um, that could be a situation. Okay. Any other questions that? Uh, I appreciate your time, and we want you to be careful out there, and uh, we would love to see your emails all come down in this case. If you have individual questions on your worksheets and you want me to review something with you, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Two quick comments um, for John and um, Favorite thing to have people do in, in uh, their light duty, or excuse me, temporary modified duty, especially if their restrictions are pretty heavy. So what, what's one of those things that we always want employees and supervisors to do that we just don't have time for? Training. Well, training, yes. If there's any annual training that they need to do, have them do that during that time period. Blake mentioned their website that has all kinds of safety training, all the online, um, uh, local gov, uh, online training that's available, those sorts of things. If they have credentialing that they need to take care of during the year, Perfect. The other one that I'd love to see you do is, here's your job description. We'd like you to go through your job description and tell us where you think it's off. Isn't that something that we always want to have them updated and never have the time to do? And if they're a supervisor, or if the injury that they had was because they, they say they followed the procedure for changing that snow blade and still injured themselves, have them walk, walk, go through the procedural manual for the road department to see if they need to change the procedure they use for changing snowball blades so that the next person doesn't get injured following their standard procedure. There's some real good things there. So every time you catch yourself or a department head saying, yeah, but we don't have time for that, put it on your temporary modified duty list. It's perfect. Second of all, um, I haven't seen this a lot in the counties, but when Blake explained that EMOD thing, you, you can see where you really can't play games with that. If you under-report your payroll, that means the estimated losses come down, and when you have the same number of loss, the same cost of losses against lower payroll, your mod goes up, and actually you pay more now because the mod doesn't just affect that one department that fudged their payroll, it affects the entire county. It, the same with 
Cody. And this is where you might want to keep an eye on things. I had one new sheriff several years ago come in and he argued until he was blue in the face with me at the sheriff's meeting that most of his staff just do paperwork. They're very seldom on the road, especially supervisors. So why are they under the county code at three bucks or whatever, why aren't they in the clerical code for 15 cents? And I see that, and I actually, when I, one of my first jobs in insurance was as a worker's compensation adjuster, and when I went from adjusting the claims to doing risk management with the counties, I bought this book that I found that 10 top ways to lower your worker's compensation costs. And one of the methods was to cheat on your coding, get as many employees of the 8810 as you possibly can.